Okay, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Hopefully people hop back on here. I think my microphone is working now. Let's see. Yes. Can you hear me now? All right, Emma. I got gotcha. you. Is it okay if I put it down here? Can you still hear me? We good? Okay. I don't know what happened. I didn't touch anything, y'all. I don't know. Okay. All good. Let's keep going. So we got the godly military. What was their role? Well, check it out in that document. Their role says very clearly that these orders or these militaries serve to protect pilgrims. So that's their first part. And they were to wage war against the Muslims. Okay. So basically, uh, they're telling me I stopped at Netflix. I was basically telling you about a series called Nightfall. It's pretty good. It tells you a little bit about the Templar. So if you're interested, you can check it out. So just to recap, number one, godly military or religious military. All right. And then number two for their role, uh, it was to protect pilgrims and wage war against the Muslims. Okay. So what is the main idea of the first passage? What do you guys think? Hey, Josue, welcome. What do you guys think the main idea of that first passage is? Somebody give it to me. Let's go. Who's ready? Who's got it? I can tell you're typing right now. Main idea of the first passage. Josue, do you know it? We did it in class today. Can you do it? Who who the crusaders protect and what they do? Main idea? Uh, okay. So you could say that they protect the pilgrims and they're supposed to attack the Muslims. Or, yeah, in Jerusalem. Very good. They protected other civilizations where they were able to create a war. Okay, that's true. In this specific case, they're just talking about the Crusades. Okay, so definitely going up against the Muslims, right? They would protect pilgrims. Very good. Okay, so let's read the second passage because we got to look for the main idea in that one. The second passage says, Whenever I visited Jerusalem, I always entered the al Asqua Mosque, beside which stood a small mosque, which the Franks had converted into a church. The Templars, who were my friends, would evacuate the little adjoining mosque so that I could pray in it. Okay, so this is written by a Muslim historian. What do you think the main idea of this one is? When it talks about the defense, is it the Templars or the Crusaders on the first passage? Okay, so the first passage, the Crusaders are the same as the Templars, okay? The Crusaders are basically all of those military orders, everyone who's going to get back the Holy Land, okay? All right, so second passage, number four, uh, the main idea, you should have something about how the Templars sometimes helped and respected Muslims, all right? Because in that passage, it's talking about the Franks. The Franks are Englishmen, okay? They are from like the German area, like modern day Germany, all right? And they go down to the Crusades and it talks about how the Templars as well as the Franks are helping the Muslims. So that would be your main idea for that. Now, number five is the important part of this. What, how, in what way, actually, in what way do the passages contradict each other? How do they differ? Okay. Contradict just means how are they different from each other? Okay. So how do they uh, differ? Rami says in the first passage, the Muslims are hated by the people. But in the second passage, the Franks respect the Muslims by letting them pray in the church. The Franks were respectful to them. Very good. And the Franks, also the Templars. Okay. So it says right here, actually, that the Franks were the ones that had converted into the church, but the Templars are their friends, okay? So Templars could, well, the Templars weren't on both sides, but in this case, it's saying that the Templars were respectful to the Muslims, right? So um, that's how it contradicts each other. So one passage says they're supposed to wage war against the Muslims, while the other one is saying that they're kind of friendly towards the Muslims. That's the contradiction. Okay, good job. Let's go on to the next one. All right, the next one is also about the Crusades, and it says what they, meaning the Franks, learned from Arabs was indispensable in their subsequent expansion. 
The heritage of Greek civilization was transmitted through Arab intermediaries. So basically what that's saying is that Greek civilization is going to spread into Arabic civilization. All right. Then it's going to become Arabic. In medicine, astronomy, chemistry, geography, mathematics, and architecture, the Franks drew their knowledge from Arabic books. So here's the Franks again, which they assimilated, um, imitated, and then surpassed. So assimilated, remember that kind of means like blended together. Imitated is, of course, copying. Surpassed, going above and beyond that, right? Um, in the realm of industry, the Europeans first learned and then improved upon the processes used by the Arabs in paper making, leather working, textiles, and the distillation of alcohol and sugar. So basically, main idea of this passage is showing that Arabic technology is spreading to whom? Who's it going to? The Europeans, right? Are the Franks the same as the Templars? No, the Templars are like an army of crusaders. The Franks also go on crusades, but they're not a Templar. To be a Templar, you have to go through a special training, okay? So in this case, this is talking about the Franks or the Europeans that are going down to crusade and try to get the Holy Land back, okay? And they're kind of working together with the Arabs and they're getting their technology, and it's saying that they assimilate it, imitate it, and surpass it. So main idea, you could put something about how it shows Arab technology is spreading through interregional contact. Okay, Interregional means all these regions kind of contacting together because of the Crusades. Yes, Dominique, I'm going to go over the whole review, hopefully, if we can get through it. Okay, so this is going to also affect European culture. Okay. How does it affect it? Well, I mean, it's basically changing it, right? It's giving them the ability to make paper. You might not think that's such a big deal, but when the printing press comes around, it's a huge deal because paper enables things to happen like revolutions and the Protestant Reformation and all these things that we're going to talk about coming up. Paper makes that all happen. Okay. So it's a big deal, this interregional contact. Okay. So who are the Franks? Put down that they are Germanic, or a Germanic, sorry, Germanic people. They first invade Rome. Back when the Roman Empire still existed, they invaded Rome. Later, they will establish a powerful kingdom in Western Europe, okay? Uh, you might remember reading about this guy. His name is Charlemagne the Great. This is how you spell it. Okay, he is the leader of um, the Holy Roman Empire, okay? That's the Franks. And he is actually going to be the one that restores this area to Christianity. So he will push towards um, becoming Christian, okay? You probably read about him. All right, and then number eight says, how did the Arab technology spread to Europe? Put down, it was through interregional contact. Interregional, you're going to see a lot. That basically just means several regions kind of contacting each other. All right. All right, Sarah, yes, this could go on number six. This would be number eight. And you can rewind for number seven. Okay, any quick questions about that document? Pretty self explanatory. You might uh, get a question about what some of the technology is that spread. There was medicine, astronomy, chemistry, geography, mathematics. As you're reading these documents, underline main ideas. Underline things that are going to help you understand the document better. Okay? Uh, number eight, yeah, you could say crusades, but definitely put the crusades caused this interregional contact. Okay? All right. And then, Rami, you can um, rewind for the main idea. Basically, showing Arab technology spreading through the Crusades and this interregional contact. And then Europe using that for developing their culture. All right, we're going to go on to number nine. Number nine, just know that is a map of the Mongol Empire. It basically spreads from China all the way over to the Middle East and some of Russia. 
Okay, Mongol Empire. Yes, Samuel. Good job. Good job, Tuan. All right, number 10. Let's go on to number 10. This one's a kind of a cool document. I just think it's it's neat how he wrote this. This is written by Marco Polo. So remember, Marco Polo goes to China during what dynasty? You remember? Beyond Dynasty. When the Mongols are there. Yes, good job, Tuan. I knew you knew that. Okay, so let's read this. It says, Hanzhou, China. And I'm pretty sure I didn't pronounce that right. So my Chinese speaker, correct me, if you will. Um, it has 10 principal markets. They are all squares of half a mile to the side and along their front passes the main street, which is 40 paces in width and runs straight from end to end of the city, crossing many bridges of easy and commodious approach. So also parallel to this great street, but at the back of the marketplaces, there runs a very large canal. Underline that because we're going to talk about that later. On the bank of which towards the squares are built great houses of stone in which the merchants from India and other foreign parts store their wares to be handy for the markets. In each of the squares is held a market three days in a week, frequented by 40 to 50,000 people. Heng Zhao. Okay, very good, Wing Ying. Thank you so much for telling me how to pronounce that. Ah, there's a silent G. Who knew? Very cool. Okay, so this one is about a marketplace in China, right? And I told you to underline the very large canal. That is talking about the Grand Canal in China, okay? That's important, and we'll talk about why that's important here in a minute. Um, also, you could underline... 40 to 50,000 people are coming through there. Are foreigners coming through? Yes, it says merchants from India and other foreign parts. Okay, so um, what's the main idea? Well, we need to say that this is describing a big trading city. Foreigners are definitely welcome. It's accessible to the Grand Canal. And uh, what does the Grand Canal do? Well, it makes merchant or it makes merchandise accessible. Because basically they use the Grand Canal for travel, okay? And for bringing in um, goods from all across China, all right? Super important because at the time, roads aren't very good. So traveling by water is definitely easier. Now remember, a canal is different than a river because a canal is man-made. So a canal doesn't have a current. You'd either have to oar through it or you would sometimes get pulled along with a rope. Like someone would be on the land pulling the the boat through all right so number 11 what did the chinese use the grand canal for bringing in goods from all across china to the marketplace okay and then uh, what made trade on the silk road possible make sure that you go all the way back to the tang and song okay tang and song they start growing the silk road because um they really really take an interest in trade but then also the mongols make it safer through Pax Mongolica. All right, so make sure that you remember that word too. Pax Mongolica. i to make sure I spell it right. Mongolica. Did I spell that right? Okay, that's basically peaceful Mongolia, okay? All right, um, let's go on to our next document. This one is about, uh, or from William of Rubuck's report to King Louis. Now remember, this one is very important to remember a point of view. This guy works for the king, okay? So he's used to nobility. He's not used to roughing it. Keep that in mind while you're reading this. It says, it is the duty of the Mongol women to drive the carts, to load the houses onto them, and to unload them, to milk the cows, to make the butter and kumis, to dress the skins, and to sew them. The men make bows and arrows, manufacture stirrups and bits and make saddles. They build the houses and carts. They look after the horses and milk the mares. Both sexes look after the sheep and goats. And sometimes the men, sometimes the women milk them. Okay. So basically, what is the main idea of this document? Well, it's showing that the Mon very good Samuel is showing that the Mongols are treated pretty much equally. The women do a lot of the hard labor right alongside of the men. I mean, picking up and loading the houses, not super easy job. 
that's definitely different than what this guy is used to because remember, this guy is familiar with nobility. So he's used to women sitting on a couch all day fanning themselves, right? Not really doing a lot of labor. So put down that uh, it shows duties according to the genders within the Mongol clans and that women are pretty much equal. They do some of the hard labor alongside the men. Now, the next question is, how do you think the author feels about this division of labor? Now, he doesn't come right out and say it, so you kind of have to infer this from the fact of his point of view, right? Now, because he's around nobles a lot, does he seem kind of impressed with this, or is he disgusted with this? What do you guys think? What's some votes? Is he like saying, yeah, this is really good, like I'm shocked, or hmm, this is disgusting, I don't think they should be doing this. Neha says, impressed. How many agree? <laughs> Juan, yeah, he definitely probably thinks it's weird. He definitely probably thinks he's surprised. Yeah, impressed, disgusted, uncomfortable. He could be a little uncomfortable. I would say there's probably more evidence in this to show that he's impressed because if he were disgusted by it, he would probably put that in there and he would tell the king, hey, this is really awful. I don't think women should be doing this, right? But um, I think this shows a little bit more of impressed and surprised because he's really putting in a lot of details about what the women are doing, okay? So I would definitely go with surprised or impressed on that um, because of how smoothly these roles play out. I mean, I think he's a little bit shocked about the fact that the women are even doing this. Okay, then um, describe how Mongol women are treated in comparison to other societies. We kind of talked about this a little bit before when we were doing the Mongol trial. So you guys should be able to get this one. Mongol women treated more equally than other societies, right? They have more duties and they have more respect. Okay, let's go on to number 16. I'm going to get a drink of water in just a second. I wish you guys could talk too because my throat gets really dry. Okay. Let's go on to the next one. The next one is about the Mongols in China. And it says, okay, so our two questions that we're trying to do with this one, before we read the document, we're looking for things that stay the same and we're looking for differences. So what I want you to do is underline the things that stay the same and circle the things that are differences, okay? So it says the Mongols made use of Chinese administrative practices, techniques of taxation and their postal system. What does that mean? Did it stay the same or was it different? Thumbs up for staying the same, thumbs down for different? Definitely a thumbs up. That means that they kept it the same, okay? They gave, so that should be, did I tell you to underline that? I think I told you to underline that. If it stays the same, underline it. Thumbs middle for I don't know. <laughs> yeah, okay. So they made use of it. That means it stays the same, okay? So definitely underline that. They gave themselves a Chinese dynastic title, the Yan, suggesting a new beginning in Chinese history. They transferred their capital from Karakuram in Mongolia to what is now Beijing, building a wholly new capital city. So that's a difference, right? So thumbs down and circle that. That's a difference. Okay. Uh, in social life, the Mongols forbade intermarriage. That means they would not allow it. So Mongols and Chinese could not marry. And they prohibited Chinese scholars from learning Mongol script. Okay. Mongol women never adopted foot binding and scandalized the Chinese by mixing with men at official gatherings and riding to the hunt with their husbands. That last part about scandalize the Chinese by mixing freely, that would be a difference, right? And the Mongol women also ride to the hunt with their husbands. So what are the things that stay the same? You'd put down administrative practices, taxes, postal system. All those things stay the same. Differences, no intermarriage. Scholars can't learn the Mongol script and the capital changes. Okay, you can also put down that Mongol women freely mix with men. All of those things would be different. Now, of course, you could probably argue that it's not super different because the Mongols weren't there before, but it definitely is a change for the Chinese because the Chinese are not used to women and men mixing. They're just not, they're not down with it. Okay, so the next one we're looking for, the main idea. Differences between what and what. Okay, so Neha, 
The differences are between when the Mongols came, like what did they change about China? What did they keep the same? Hi, Annie. Good to see you. You might want to re rewind. And also, I've got a first part that kind of cut off. I'll put that up here um, after I'm done. Yuan. Huh, really? Okay. I am learning so much from you, kiddo. Okay. Yuan Dynasty. I'm going to be a professional Chinese speaker by the time this is all done. Okay. Peter Smith, don't be creepy. I mean, come on. Okay. Let's, uh, let's go on. Okay. So... We're going to look at this uh, Ways of the World, this next document. Okay. <laughs> okay, so here we go. Beyond the human catastrophe lay the damage to Persian and Iraqi ar uh, agriculture to those who tilled the soil. So we know we're talking about Persia and we're talking about Iraq. And we're talking about agriculture, right? Heavy taxes, sometimes collected 20 or 30 times a year, and often under, under torture or whipping, pushed large numbers of peasants off of their land. Furthermore, the in-migration of nomadic Mongols, together with their immense herds of sheep and goats, turned much agricultural land into pastures and sometimes into deserts. Okay, so we know that this is about the in-migration of nomadic Mongols, okay? This is when the Mongols are coming in and taking over Persia and Iraq after they defeated the caliph. As a result, a fragile system of underground water channels that provided irrigation to the fields was neglected and much good agricultural land was reduced to waste. Okay, so what's the main idea of this document? Let's break it down. It's saying that there was a human catastrophe. Oh, beyond the human catastrophe, sorry. So beyond the human catastrophe, beyond the deaths that it took to come in and conquer Persia and Iraq. There was also an agricultural problem, okay? Now, in Persia and Iraq, they had these things. They were called quanates. Quanates, I think. This is how you spell it. That's a Q, okay? And it was like underground irrigation. And it was these tunnels that were underground that would take water to the crops. When the Mongols come in and they bring their herds, they stomp on those fields and the underground irrigation caves in okay this is the part at the very end where it says these underground water channels that have provided irrigation neglected and land is laid to waste all right so remember in china the nomads they brought in their herds but they also started farming in persia and iraq they didn't do that as much they were bringing in their herds okay um, no, not like that, Neha. It's more of like um, underground tunnels. So if you have a field like this, you might have a tunnel underneath here where, let me see if I can find some blue chalk. I think I got some blue chalk for water. The water is going to run through and then it kind of comes up this way. I'm not exactly sure how they pulled it up. I would have to look. I'm sure there's a YouTube video about it. Um, but eventually it's going to like pull up and help the crops. So when the herds come in, they kind of stomp down on those and it caves them in. Okay. So yes, team vanilla, it is about agricultural troubles. Absolutely. But you need to put down that um, it basically Persia and Iraq's fields were destroyed by the Mongol herds. Okay. The herds crushed the irrigation system and the tunnels underground called the Quanat system. Okay, remember this word, the Quanat system. That's what the irrigation system is called. So basically the herds are crushing them. Okay. All right. You got it, Neha? All right. Let's see. Um, more of the Mongols destroyed Persia. Yes, very good, Tuan. Uh, so the main idea is that there were many deaths, but the most impactful thing was this agriculture. So uh, I wouldn't say necessarily that it's the most impactful thing. He's saying that above and beyond the deaths, this thing also happened, okay? Um, but you don't have to get that crazy with it. Just know exactly what caused it, right? The herds coming in, crushing this um, irrigation system. Okay, we are on question 19 now. That's true. Quanat 
was not mentioned in the passage. Sometimes you have to know some outside uh, information. Okay, so we're going on to number 19, and this one is about uh, Mansa Musa, and we need to know the uh, main idea of the passage. So it says, from the beginning of my coming to stay in Egypt, I heard talk of the arrival of this Manza Musa on his pilgrimage and found people eager to recount what they had seen of his spending. I asked a person and he told me the riches of Manza Musa. So this is talking about when he was on a pilgrimage or a hajj. Remember we talked about how he goes on a hajj and as he's going, he's kind of like going like this and he's boosting all the economies. In some places, kind of destroying the economies because he's putting too much money uh, back into the economy. So it says, the man said, when I went out to meet him, he did me honor and treated me with the greatest courtesy. He addressed me, however, only through an interpreter, despite his perfect ability to speak in the Arabic tongue. Then he gave away gold and other valuables. I tried to persuade him to go up to meet the sultan, the ruler of Cairo. But Mansa Musa said, I came from the pilgrimage, or I came for the pilgrimage and nothing else. I do not wish to mix anything else with my pilgrimage. So basically, main idea here is that Manza Musa is going on Hajj or pilgrimage, and he is spending a lot of money. He's definitely showing a lot of wealth, but what's his purpose? His only purpose is to go on this Hajj. It's not really to meet with any, you know, upper leaders or any other kings. He's just going on this pilgrimage. And then how did he acquire his wealth? This isn't said in the passage. This is outside information that you need to know. Remember, we talked about how Mali was situated on the Trans-Saharan trade route. And so that enables him to acquire wealth. Okay. Manza Ma Mausa? Really? Hmm. That's interesting. Well, I have a friend named Musa, so I just assumed that it was Musa. But Mausa. Okay, thank you, Neha. I appreciate that. Y'all are just helping me with my pronunciation. I, I appreciate it because uh, that's one thing that I am not great at. Uh, Tuan says he prefers Musa. Well, you know, if Tuan says Musa, then I don't know. <laughs> but Mausa, is it Mausa? Mausa or Mosa? Mosa. Like mowing the yard? Mosa? I don't know. Okay. Uh, gold salt trade. Yes, that's right, David. Yes, Rami, that is right. Okay. Uh, so 20 would be that he, the trade route, um, I'm sorry, Molly is located on the Trans-Saharan trade route. That is how he gets his money. Timbuktu is the city. Okay. Oh, like moose. Now, Tw yeah, I, that's how I'm saying it, Tuan, but she's saying it's like mousa, mousa. Okay. Oops, I skipped one. All right, let's go on. Okay. Ooh, this one's good. This one is a comparison between Ibn Battuta and Marco Polo. So the question you're looking for is describe the differences of the two travelers. Yes, Henry. He is the ruler of Mali. Tuan Polo. <laughs> I won that game. Okay, so here we go. It says, Ibn Battuta traveled primarily in Muslim-ruled lands, the Dar al-Islam, while the Christian Polo, son of European merchant, lived and worked in countries whose soldiers and religions were foreign to him. Hmm, what are we looking for? The differences of the two travelers. I would underline that first sentence and then be able to explain it. What's the difference? Well, Ibn Battuta traveled in Muslim-ruled lands. He is also Muslim. Okay. And the Christian Marco Polo, he um, went to countries that the religions were foreign to him, okay? This difference, ah, oh, here we go, makes a comparison of their works most interesting. So the author's already telling us that that's a difference. Marco Polo's knowledge of four Asian languages as well as Italian allowed him to communicate with foreigners and even work as an administrator for the Chinese emperor. Yet, in all his travels, he remained culturally an outsider to the people he met. And this fact enhanced his power of observation and stimulated natural curiosity. So underlying that, Marco Polo is an outsider. By contrast, that's your key to, hey, here the difference is coming. Ibn Patuta usually traveled 
as an insider, and his host accepted him as a respected, uh, respected Muslim jurist and student of Islam. Okay, so here you go. Real important. Okay, you need to put down the differences and the similarities. Okay, so I'm sorry. Yeah, the differences of the two travelers. No similarities. So number 21, differences of the two travelers. Ivan Batuta is traveling as an insider. That means he's staying with people that are mostly like him. Okay, they would have the same point of view. Marco Polo is traveling as an outsider to Asian civilizations. Okay. So does that make sense to everybody? Of course, it's going to be a little bit different. Marco Polo is going to be writing from an outsider's point of view, whereas Ivan Batuta is going to be writing from more of an insider's point of view. Um, that one was from, I don't remember. That one might be from the AMSCO. It doesn't say, does it? I'm not sure where that is. Okay, here we go. Number, oh, 22. Um, so why was it safer to travel through Asia when Marco Polo traveled through versus if he would have went at another time? Okay, so when did Marco Polo travel? That's important to know, right? Basically, it would have been when the Mongols were under control. So you're going to write down the Pax Mongolica. The Mongols were making the Silk Road safer, and this enables Marco Polo to travel through at that time. Very good, Peter. Yes, you got it. Pax Mongolia. Okay. Uh, yeah, it might be in the new one. I'm not sure. Uh, did Marco Polo travel by himself? No, he had several other people with him, uh, several assistants, and uh, it was kind of like a caravan. And his diary is quite intense. I mean, he kept a really good journal. He actually ended up writing a book, and a lot of people thought that it was a lie for a long time, but I think it's really good. Uh, let's see. Would there be another other similarities other than them being explorers and travelers? Well, this one's not asking for the similarities. Remember, it's just asking for the differences, okay? Definitely, there are some similarities, um, but it's not asking for that in this passage, so you don't have to worry about it. Um, uh, yes, you are right about the AMSCO textbook, but you know, you can take it to like Kinko's and get the spine cut off and they can, uh, coil it. I've done that to a couple of mine. Okay. Oh, eBay for $10 next year, huh? <laughs> yeah. I'll buy it from you for $10, maybe for my kids next year. I don't know. Check with me at the end of the year. Okay. Now, the next one is about this chart. Okay. This chart is comparing Silk Road, Indian Ocean, trans saharan trade route. This one should be pretty easy. You're looking for differences between the trade routes. Start giving me some. What are some differences that you see? I want to make you guys do some work. While well, I take a drink of my water here. What are some differences? Things traded. Yes. There are some differences in things traded. There are also some similarities in the things traded. So primarily Silk Roads would be luxury items. Um, Indian Ocean would be things that are a little bit heavier, right? Because it's on water. So um, things that are easier to, to trade on water. We've got uh, slaves in the trans -Saharan. They're primarily traded there. Uh, definitely, let's see the things they traded. The ideas are different. Religion. What's different about religion? Give me some. Um, give me some uh, specific examples. Specific examples. Okay, Islam through the uh, Sahara. Yes, very good. Okay, goods were different. Uh, so slaves in the Trans-Saharan, luxury goods on the Silk Road, and a mix of luxury goods with the Indian Ocean Trade Route. Good, Rami. Yes, that's good. Uh, what else? We got Buddhism and Islam. Tuan, where were Buddhism and Islam mostly spread? Let's see. Let's see if we can look. Uh, Southeast, okay, good. So Buddhism didn't go in the um, 
in the it's Saharan. That's good. Buddhism through the uh, Indian Ocean and silk. Mm -hmm. Christianity only in the Indian Ocean trade route, mostly in the Muslim or sorry, mostly in the Mediterranean basin. So like around in the Mediterranean uh, Ocean. Very good. Okay, Islam far southeast. Very good. Okay, we're going to move on. Uh, I'm going to block you here pretty soon. Please stop. Uh, I'm going to put you in timeout. Okay. All right, so gold salt in the Sahara. Very good. Okay, so basically that chart's pretty easy. Um, just, you know, be able to read it, and you should be all right on that. Yes, I do, Peter. <laughs> I was trying to do it. I think I figured out how to um, delete him, though. So that works out good. Okay. Let's go to number 24. Why, thank you, Peter. I, I believe that they are. <laughs> and we got 67 listeners. All right. Let's give me those watch minutes. Okay, number 24. According to the passage, what did, and I'm going to pronounce it wrong again, it's Zhang Ha, huh? I think, uh, or... I don't know. Tell me again. Compare to the first. Okay. Uh, huh. Yes. Okay. Good. And his crew think about the people they encountered. Okay. So we're going to read this one and see what they think about the people they encountered. It said from the time when we Zhang Ha and his companions at the beginning of the Yangle period received the Imperial Commission as envoys to the barbarians up till now, seven voyages have taken place, and each time we have commanded several tens of thousands of government soldiers and more than a hundred ocean going vessels. Okay, so what do they think about the people? It says right here they were commissioned as envoys or messengers to the barbarians. Underline that. Okay, so, um, the they were envoys to the barbarians so they think that the people are barbarians right and then it says um on arriving in the outlying countries those among the foreign kings who were obstructing the transforming influence of chinese culture and were disrespectful were captured alive and brigades who gave themselves over to violence and plunder were exterminated so what's he saying here basically if you didn't fall into line as a foreign king and come under the transforming influence of the Chinese, you're going to die. Okay. That's basically what he said. Okay. Uh, then it says, consequently, the sea route was purified and tranquilized and the natives owing to this were enabled quietly to pursue their avocations. Okay. So, they were purified and tranquilized. They basically helped the natives, right? All this is due to the aid of the goddess to whom this marker is dedicated. We have written an inscription on the stone and have moreover recorded the years and months of our voyages, both going and returning in order to make these known forever. Okay, so this is from a stone marker erected in March 31st, 1431 at a temple near the port where Zhang He's fleet set off on their expedition. So according to the passage, what did they think of the people that they encountered? They think that they're barbarians. How did they treat them? Well, it depends. If they were receptive and they did what the Chinese wanted them to do and accepted Chinese culture, then they were probably treated fairly well. If not, they were killed. And then how did they justify their treatment of people they encountered? Well, in that third paragraph, it says they were purifying and tranquilizing the neighbors, or the, the natives, sorry. Um, and this enabled them to pursue other things. So they're, they're helping them. They're purifying them, right? So basically, they're justifying it by saying, hey, we're helping these barbarians. Now, I want you to remember this because when we start talking about the explorers, you're going to see this from the European standpoint as well. And they're going to talk in very similar ways. Okay, I'm glad you're learning a lot. You're always welcome. We do these about once a week. Depends on what's going on. Maybe it might be Sunday, Monday, or Tuesday. So make sure and subscribe and hit that notification bell so that you don't miss it. Okay, uh -huh. oh my goodness. What are these spammers doing? I'm gonna put them out. 
There we go. Okay. So everybody got that one? Put him out. Okay. Sarah was here. Um, okay. <laughs> Lady Nadia, I like you. Stop, fool. Very good. Okay. So, yes, I did block them, David. I just had to figure out how to do it. I never I never had to do it before. Okay, so 26 again. They're basically justifying their treatment by saying, hey, we are helping the natives. We're purifying them. And that third paragraph is where he talks about purifying and tranquilizing them. Okay, who knows where they came from? People are crazy. Okay, um, they believe they were helping the societies. Thank you, Henry. Okay, let's go on. We're almost done. We're almost there, guys. Let's go. All right, 27. What is the historical context of the document? Okay, historical context is something you're going to see a lot this year as soon as we start talking about DBQs. Historical context basically means what is going on at the same time that this document is written that affects how the document is written. Okay, so this is going on in 1520. We haven't talked a lot about that specific date. So it might be a little bit of challenge or it might be a little bit of a challenge to figure out this historical context, but let's try. So it says in the tank, I saw so many people at work that there must have been 15 or 20,000 men looking like ants so that you could not see the ground on which they walk. So many there were this tank, the king portioned out against his captain captains each of whom had the duty of seeing that the people placed under him did their work and that the tank was finished and brought to completion. Okay, so they're clearly building something here, right? Um, what do you think they might be building? Something to do with water? They call it a tank, right? So I would say that the historical context is this is describing a large building project, okay? Now, we haven't talked in depth about the Black Death yet, but you do know that it happens because it spreads on the Silk Road. And we talked about how the Black Death kills one-third of Europeans and a lot of other people around the world. So after it kills all those people, there's a huge labor shortage, okay? But the problem is now we've had all this, like, interregional contact, so people want products, people want goods. And so this pushes the, the supply or the demand, sorry, this pushes the demand for products higher, and therefore we need more laborers, okay? So for this, you're going to put down that um, this is describing a large building project. Good, Peter. Labor gets expensive because of the shortage. Very good, okay? I would think that this is some kind of like water facility, kind of like a reservoir, okay? Um, and then you're going to write down that after the Black Death, Demand for laborers and products increases. Because of that, large infrastructure product uh, projects also increase because we need a way to get these products to market, right? So we need more canals. We need more water reservoirs. We need more military defenses. We need more roads, okay? So labor increases. And the need for building stuff also increases. These aren't slaves here in this passage, but it kind of made it sound a little bit like that. When I looked up the whole package that, or the whole passage, it's not talking about slaves here. But they did use slaves for some labor. Yes, that's true. Okay. Uh, why am I watching this while doing my... I don't know why you're watching it while doing your poem annotations. You definitely should do those separately. It's going to be hard to do them together. Okay. Uh, we are now on question 28, and it's about the image. So flip over to that one. This one is an image of the point of the water tank. Uh, it was a water reservoir to hold water for that area. Ooh, got fuzzy there for a minute. Sorry. Um, after the Black Death... So, Rana, is it Raina? Raina says, um, were they poorly paid? After the Black Death, they're actually going to be able to um, uh, demand more money because there were fewer of them. So, feudalism kind of comes to an end because of the Black Death and because they can demand more. Yes, Neha, kind of like a dam. Yes. 
Okay, Annie, wait a minute. How is the need of building connected with the test? Well, you're going to have a question about that document. That's how it's connected. So you may need to know that that's what the document's about. All right, let's go on. Chris Schaefer is, I thought I blocked him. Like, seriously, dude, get out of here. Okay. Uh, okay, that's cool. You can definitely take AP World History next year. Just make sure, uh, are you talking about taking the test this year? Because I don't, I don't know if you'll be able to do that. Um, I don't know. Give me some more details about that. All right, number 28. What system does the above image reference? What are the Uker nomads doing in this picture? And why are they doing it? Okay, so the system that it represents is the tribute system. Remember we talked about this where the Uger nomads had to pay tribute to the Chinese. Okay, it's called the tribute system. And it's spelled like this. Tribute system. And what is he doing? You can see in the picture that he is bowing down to the general. He's probably giving the general a gift. You can see in the bottom of that picture, there's like a little vase looking thing. All right, so basically he's paying tribute. Now the bowing down has a special name and that special name is kowtow, okay? Get that down. He is kowtowing to show respect through the tribute system. Okay, kowtowing basically, it, see that back nomad all the way in the back? He's got his hands completely on the ground. Kowtowing is getting as low as you possibly can in order to show respect. Okay. <clears throat> Blend fix? I'm not sure about that question. I don't know. Okay, uh, so your next question is, when did the Mongols take over China? They're going to start their conquest in 1205. Yan Dynasty, I'm sorry, uh, Yuan, Yuan Dynasty is going to start in 1279. Okay, so remember that date range, all right? 1200s is when they're going to start like their conquest of, um, of China. The nomads are the ones that are bowing down in the picture. Okay, the Chinese guy would be the one standing up. Okay, number 30. After the Mongols took over China and formed the Yuan Dynasty, what happens to this system? Well, because the Mongols are nomads as well, they're going to get rid of this system. They no longer need it. So put down this system, no longer needed. Okay. All right, let's go on. Ooh, we're almost done. Number 31. So it's asking, what is the historical context uh, in regards to these metal coins? Okay, so what you need to know about the metal coins is that metal coins didn't always exist, okay? There were different forms of, of uh, currency before metal coins, such as bartering. All right, bartering just simply means I have something you want, you have something I want, so we trade, okay, bartering. Now they also use different things for currency. Uh, an example is called a cowrie shell. These are kind of like little seashells. They also used tin ingots, okay, little pieces of tin. Okay, so there were different things um, that they would use for currency. So historical context of this would be switching from other forms of currency to metal coins. And the metal coins are what you see pictured in that um, document up there. Make sure you get down that these are the other forms of possible currency, bartering, cowie shells, and tin ingots. Now, it depends on what region you're in, you might use something else as well if one of these is not available. Okay. We got another Ibn Battuta document, and this one says, the entire population of the city joined the Exodus, male and female, small and large. The, Jew the Jews went out with their book of the law and the Christians with their gospel, their women and children with them, the whole concourse of them in tears and humble supplications, imploring the favor of God through his books and his prophets. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. 
Wanging, you can also put down flying cash. Very good. That comes from the AMSCO book. I can tell you're doing your reading. All right, girl. All right. Okay. So this one is important because when I first read this, I thought that the Muslims were kicking the Jews and the Christians out. But that is not the case. If you look at number 32, that tells you the historical context. And it says the historical context of this document is that Ibn Battuta was witnessing an exodus of people out of Damascus as a result of the outbreak, the outbreak of the plague or the Black Death. Okay, so they hoped that by leaving, it would lower the death tool, toll. Sorry. So they're leaving Damascus okay, because they're trying to get away from the plague. So what is the point of view of this document? Remember, for point of view, you have to say who the author is, what do they believe, and why do they believe it? So you would say something like, Ibn Battuta is Muslim. He believes in religious tolerance and respect for Christians and Jews because of his religion. So his religion is giving him that belief of tolerance. That's his point of view. Uh, Henry, to answer your question, the coins uh, that showed the metal was accepted as currency. Yes, that would be like the new currency. That takes over from this stuff. Okay, everybody got the point of view of Ibn Battuta. I'm going to tell you one more time. Ibn Battuta is Muslim, and his religious tolerance and respect for Christians and Jews is because of his religion. So that's the point of view of the document. Okay, or That's the point of view of Ibn Battuta, the writer. Okay, That's what the question is asking you. What is the point of view of this document written from? Okay, it might not be worded very good, Neha, but that's what it means. Like, what is his point of view as the author? His point of view is that he has religious tolerance because he's a Muslim. Okay, make sure that you get that last part, though, that because he's a Muslim. Not just that he has religious tolerance. The reason that he has it is because of his religion. All right, what does this show about Islam as a religion? It shows that they are tolerant of other religions. Okay, we good to go with that one? I'm like super thirsty tonight. I don't know why. Okay. So let's go on to number 34. Ah, you'll have to rewind it, Nadia. Lady Nadia. Lady Nali Nadia. Just rewind it. You can go back, I think. I'm pretty sure you can do that. Anyway, okay. Uh, so number 34 asks, what is the Hagia Sophia? So we knew not whether we were in heaven or earth. For on earth there is no such splendor or such beauty and we are at loss for how to describe it. We know only that God dwells there among men, and their service is fairer than the ceremonies of other nations, for we cannot forget that beauty. So this is by a Rus advisor for Prince Vladimir, describing the Hagia Sophia. All right, so what is the Hagia Sophia? The Hagia Sophia is a church that was once Christian and then turns into a mosque. This is what it looks like right here. Okay. Um, when it was just a church, it didn't have these spires that was built later when it was turned into a mosque. So originally this dome area was the original church. So put down that it's first a Christian church and then it is turned into a mosque. What is the Hagia Sophia's architecture inspired by Roman arches and domes? Okay. So this church is definitely inspired by Rome. It shows that the Roman architecture is continuing. Okay. Um, and then it says originally Hagia Sophia was constructed for what religion? It was originally Christian and it is now Muslim today. Now this last part says what, uh, number 37, why do the Russians convert to Orthodox Christianity? This happens because Prince Vladimir is making a um, peace treaty with the Byzantium empire or the Byzantine empire. Okay. And basically he agrees to marry one of their princesses as a part of the treaty. Their princess happens to be an Orthodox Christian. And so as a part of a treaty, he has to convert. So he agrees to converting, and then he orders the rest of Kiev Rus to convert as well. So write down that um, Vladimir, the prince of Russia, marries a Christian princess, and he orders the rest of Kiev to convert as well. Okay. 
Uh, difference between Muslim and Islamic. Islamic is the religion. Muslim is or are the people. Okay. Is this our last? Oh, it's our last document. <laughs> this is so exciting. So exciting. Um, that will give you guys plenty of time to review this so that you're ready for the test tomorrow. Okay. So we're looking for the main idea of this speech. It says, this royal city, therefore situated at the center of the world, is now held captive by those who do not know God. She, or Jerusalem, seeks therefore and desires to be liberated and does not cease to implore you to come to her aid. Accordingly, undertake this journey for the remission of your sins and the assurance of the imperishable glory of the kingdom of heaven. This is Pope Urban II, a sermon given in a field outside the cathedral in Claremont after the church council in 1095. So main idea of this speech. Okay, basically, he's trying to get people to sign up to go and fight in the Holy Land. And if you go and fight, what's going to happen? Well, you guessed it, your sins will be forgiven, okay? And the part that he talks about, um, Jerusalem seeks and desires to be liberated. That means they want to be free. And they implore you to come to the, their aid. They want you so badly to come to their aid. And if you undertake this journey, you will get remission of sins. That means forgiveness of your sins. Yes, this would be a call, Henry, to go on the Holy Crusades. That's what this is. Okay. Uh, and then very last question, 39. What was Pope Urban II trying to accomplish by giving his speech? Basically, he's trying to get people to go and fight in order to recapture Jerusalem from the Muslims. <laughs> okay. So I think that's it. One last thing before I let you guys go. Tomorrow, when you're taking the test, slow down, make sure you read the questions. There's always that one answer that's a distractor. It's made to look like the real answer, but it is not the real answer. Don't guess that one, okay? Make sure you're really looking at these closely, all right? Make sure you're remembering the wording that we talked about in the documents, the main ideas, okay? That's super important. If you have time tonight, put some of this stuff on flashcards and, um, then you can review the flashcards on your way to school tomorrow, okay? And last but not least, on Sunday, mark your calendars, Sunday at 7, I'll be doing a review of the LEQ rubric because on Monday we're going to start writing one, okay? So that will give you guys a little bit of a heads up about what is coming. All right, guys, good luck on that test. Stop by, let me know how you did when you get them back. And try not to stress out. Just take deep breaths. You've got this. You understand these documents. Just keep telling yourself that and you're going to do great. And you guys are so welcome. I appreciate you listening. You make it worth doing this and it's so much fun. I, I really, really enjoy it. So also, if you weren't here for the very beginning, make sure and listen to your teachers. If they tell you to do something in class like a study guide, do it in class. And then that way you can go faster and check your answers when we're actually doing the review online. All right, guys, I am heading out of here. I will see you tomorrow. Make sure and stop by and let me know how you did. Have a good night. Bye.